Well, hello and welcome to PM Express. And today, fighting corruption is what's on the table. But in truth, we just love to hate corruption. There's nothing in us that says that yes, we are fed up with it because we want to stop it. The very people who corruption will affect, rip them off for their daily livelihood, turn up at the hospital and meet no doctors, are the very ones who put on the party t-shirts, whichever party they belong to, and defend it to the hilt. Wrong or right, they will stand firm and will not even be bold to look to the party and say, listen, this is wrong. And so how do we fight corruption? Here we are with the winner takes all system. How in the hell do I cross carpet to go and say, oh, you know, Mr. Mahama, you're doing well, or Mr. Nanado, you are doing well. We won't do that because if I do that, eventually I am campaigning for him. Our system is such that the party should be first and not nation. And since we haven't changed it, who says we're going to stop corruption? And in any case, anytime we talk about corruption, we all be lying to the partisan politic or the political figure. Everybody else, the teacher, the school bearer, the gate man, we are all sort of excluded. Me, the presenter, I'm excluded, I'm not corrupt. It's only the little few 2% who are seen in frontline politics who are deemed to be corrupt. So how are we going to fight corruption? And uh, if I may borrow from uh, Mr. Batidan, he says, the first thing you know that corruption won't go anywhere is if they always assume that it's those who just left power who are corrupt, then you know we are treading on the wrong path. It is assuming that if you are in power, you're not corrupt. It's only those who left. And so they start chasing those who have left office. But those who are in office are equally corrupt, just waiting for their turn to leave for the others to come and chase them. Folks, we just love to hate it and we don't really want to fight it. But that's how we're looking to look at it. It's, uh, is this government doing anything different to show that, yes, indeed, they are fighting corruption? Hmm. My name is Nana Ansakwal IV, Chief of the Little Republic of Akumwe Dumasa, with very little corruption, I must say. When I come back, I'm talking to uh, Dr. Bosman Asari. Don't go away. Well, thank you very much for staying with me in studio. Dr. Bosman Asari, head of political science department. So he really understands the implication of winner takes all and how it is that you can fight corruption based on this system. You must be Jesus Christ indeed. You must be God to be able to fight this system and uh, fight corruption at the same time. Dr. Bosman Asari, uh, you probably will beg to differ on my, on my position. But here we are, if I win, I have everything. And so how they me come and say, oh, the previous government actually did better in this aspect than I am doing, or they did good at this than I am doing. So basically, you're just telling your viewers that, well, that's it. You, you know good at it. Get out and let me bring somebody else. I think uh, that, that's the nature of the politics, and I think you rightly articulated. It's a winner-takes-all system. So anytime you get a chance to be there, you want to send a clear message to the people out there that you are the one who can prosecute the agenda of development, the agenda of addressing corruption. So if even certain things happen in the past which uh, deserves to be recognized, to be acknowledged, at times, you want to downplay because you want to send a clear message to the uh, Ghanaian people, the voters, and even those who are not aligned to a political party that you are the one who can ensure that things are done properly. And when you live in a system like that, it's very difficult for the citizens. It's also very difficult for the politicians. Well, for we, the citizens, then we are looking at the signals, which one appears to be doing the best. But the reality is that as citizens of the republic, at times, we must also look at our circumstances, the way things are happening in the country, then we'll be able to make the judgment for ourselves, rather than always uh, listening to what the politicians will say as the final word, where the citizens must also be interested in the affairs 
of our country. If you live in the districts, make sure you know what things are changing, what progress, uh, what are the progress being made, etc. So once citizens are involved in the process, we are not going to wait for a party to tell us that oh, we think we are doing better in the fight against corruption than what the previous People did. The way we, when we need our passport, we need the driving license and we go there. The things that transpired there should send a clear signal to us that the people at the helm of affairs, they are living up to expectation or they are not. On that note, and I'll come back to citizens being interested in uh, you know, this you know, day-to-day -day governance. Uh, we'll come back and find out if indeed citizens are interested. But let's just listen to uh, the mud slinging between uh, ex-president uh, Mahama and the current vice president Ma Baumia. I think that when a new government comes into power, you should give it a honeymoon so that it can settle in, you know. But unfortunately, it looks like MPP is quickling away its honeymoon period with the mistakes that it is doing. Otherwise, 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 how can you launch? a Google GPS system that is freely available on our mobile phones and say it's a national addressing system. You know, and it's, a, it's, it's such a pity. You know, why will you embarrass the president so much? You go and take a whole president and bring him to launch a system that is essentially 419. You know, and when you talk about accountability, this is where uh, the president should show that he's serious about corruption. Somebody must account for 15 million Ghana CDs giving away free of charge. When I was in office, there was a bus branding incident, 3.6 million Ghana CDs. A minister of state resigned because of 3.6 million CDs. In power, in, in, when you come into office and you want to cover up, you can cover up. When things happen, you just refuse to investigate them. The toughness of the fight against corruption is that you're able to take action against your own people. And that is what we did when we were in office. Here, the MPP seems unable to take, the president seems unable to take firm action in, in, in anything. We know a 419 scam when we see one. And that, unfortunately, was the hallmark of the administration of former President Mahama. Ghanaians will find out more soon, very soon, as people are held legally accountable for all these scams. With the record that the former president has in the area of governance, it is incredible that he would have the effrontery to talk about 419 scams. We have spent $2.3 million on the, on the national digital property addressing system. And I dare say it is money well spent for the benefit of all Ghanaians. It is not money finding itself into the pockets of a few cronies. We did not spend it on guinea fowls or bus branding or overpriced mansions and contracts or ghost roads. We have spent it on something productive. As a result, Ghana has an excellent digital addressing system. If the former president, Mahama, can take care and, and some time just to read and learn about it. It was developed by Ghanaians, and we should collectively take pride in their work and not try to pull them down. Work is proceeding. We are motoring on. And the National Digital Property Addressing System will be implemented with the physical tagging of every house next year, as well as the synchronization of the digital address of each property with the address on the utility bills of the property. I should note that propaganda did not help the former President Mahama when he was in government, and it is certainly not going to help him in opposition. The usual, the usual, the usual, you don't expect any more, you don't expect any less. Everybody's saying, I am better than the other, or at least you actually got into the point where he said, I am less evil than the other. That's where we have got into where you say, well, I didn't take as much as you did. And citizens getting interested. So 
uh, doctor, you, you realize that instead of citizens detaching themselves and looking at Ghana as a whole and thinking, well, look, hold on, you know, if you are saying you took this amount and he's saying he took this amount, these are amounts that were taken from us. But we, the citizens, are also fighting against it. Oh, well, he didn't take as much as your guys did. No, he didn't take. And so, you know, they, they, they are happy taking. Uh, I think uh, uh, certainly they, they will be. But, you know, the reality is that it appears as if the citizens are also divided, like the way the, pol the two main political mm -hmm. parties are divided. Mm -hmm. Normally, in a well-functioning society, what you say is that the citizens who even identify with party A and party B, any time something is going on which is not right, you are going to have those citizens who identify with the party coming out strongly to condemn it at times very, very aggressively. But we know we live in a system where any time something goes wrong, we expect people from the other side, people from the other party, to come and condemn. Because we think that for those of us who identify with party A, once we say it, then we are exposing our party mm -hmm. to public radical. And you, know, you rightly said, this is a winner-takes-all system. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that you don't wash your dirty uh, clubs in the public. So once things are even bad, those who identify with the party, we tend to keep quiet. But I think as we make progress as a, as a working democracy, as a developmental democracy, as a society, although you identify with the MPP or the NDC, if certain things are going on which is not right, the party you support is engaging massive corruption, massive incompetence or negligence, and you identify with the party, you should be able to point that out because if the party does very well, all of us as a people benefit. And I think this is a missing uh, something which is so important and it's missing in our politics. I mean, based on this fundamental that we are setting up, uh, what can this current administration do with regards to fighting corruption? Because at the moment, all they are saying is that, well, we are going to go and chase all those who were in power for the last eight years and whatever it is they did wrong, we know we are going to bring them to book. We'll come up with a special prosecutor. And it's as if to say, you know, as for us, we just came in with 110 angels. So it's those who left who are the devils that we are going to chase. I mean, is that not uh, a tricky one to start with? No, I think you, you mentioned something about the, uh, the office of the special prosecutor. Mm. No, normally, when you assume office and the nature of the politics we practice in Ghana, not only in Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, all the similarly situated countries. I think Ghanaians in general believe that uh, corruption is a massive problem and it's not only in Ghana, other countries mm -hmm. in Africa, their citizens believe that. So there's always, and we always admit that those in power once they are there, but we look at normally the campaigns the political parties run and at times people get the information about the properties people have. And we also know that the salaries given to these public officials, this is a public information is out there. So at times people do the calculations and they realize that no, if this is the salary you are being paid over the eight years and you are able to acquire this property, then definitely you got the money through certain uh, mm -hmm. illegitimate means. So the tendency that once a party has left office, corruption allegations will be, will be uh, heaped against the party is something which is very, very uh, practical in African democracies. But that doesn't suggest that the new administration is immune from corruption. The reality is that you made a statement by one of the anti-corruption uh, crusaders mm -hmm. in this country that the key way to fight corruption is to be able to deal it in your government, the mm -hmm. people who are working for you. And I think Mr. Mahama rightly pointed that out. So I know with the Office of the Special Prosecutor and some of the uh, pronouncement of the President and even the Vice President, there's a clear indication that uh, corruption is something which is going to be fought with a certain level of aggression. Although we haven't seen so much significant development from that particular front, I believe that if the Office of the Special Prosecutor or the bill, everything goes on very well, you have someone who is at, as independent as possible, then we'll begin to see whether this is a government that can really fight corruption within that same administration. And once that can be done, I think we'll make progress. But the, the reality also is that Ghanaians must admit that we have come a very, very long way from 1993 when we began this journey. We've seen some progress being made, although the progress is so incremental, very, very slow. But as we move forward, our, a number of our citizens, significant percentage of them are becoming so aware, so understanding of the nature of politics and what is expected 
of leadership. So I believe that although the changes are very, very incremental, we'll get to the point where Ghanaians will begin to make more demands on leadership. And once you are there and people are making so much demands that corruption must be addressed by any means necessary, I believe the leadership will also respond in a similar fashion. Doc, you see, the special prosecutor is going to come. And one of the things that I foresee is that, you see, there are so many things that are devilish wrong, but they are not illegal. So, you know, you have a minister, uh, you know, of a constituency that are very poor, but, you know, the state has provided him with the topmost luxury car. By all accounts, it's wrong. If this minister were running this business as his private entity, there was no way he would have taken this money to drive this car because you say, no, we are not making enough money. money. However, if you were to take him to court to say, oh, well, you know, special prosecutor, there was doc doctor while the people of La were struggling, you know, the state bought him this. So what? And here we are all saying that, yeah, jail them all. They were all driving these four big cars around. <laughs> jail them, jail them. And what can you jail them? I was listening to the 6 o'clock news. Inus of Husseini said there was a freeze on uh, purchase of government land. Just before he left office, he lifted the ban, and I'm sure there was a flood of people coming in to buy. What can you jail him for? Nothing. But you sit back and think, oh, hold on. If you were leaving office, why wouldn't you want the next guy come in, look at the scenario before? But while, you know, there's the pandemonium, you leave office, there's a vacuum, and then you leave the ban. I mean, you can't do anything. But you sit back and say, no, it's wrong. So, you see, that's what the special prosecutor is going to face. So many wrong things, but nothing illegal. I, you know, apart from, apart from uh, using the law or, let's say, the constitution, you know, in, in, in running a society, governing a society, apart from the legal dimension, we must also be interested in the moral. So I even think that uh, there is a scripture in the Bible, Paul says that mm -hmm. I can do, that I'm permitted to do it, but I know it is not the right thing mm -hmm. for me to do. In other words, there are certain things that are legal, but they are completely unacceptable, especially when you are leading a society. I think that the problem we have in our society, I mentioned something about mm -hmm. citizens. Now, now, I think it's a major problem. Now, you, you, are, you are a traditional uh, authority mm -hmm. chief, so you understand. When the people you are leading, they begin to make certain demands. If you are the one in charge, you begin to sit up and realize that, no, these people I'm leading, in the past I was taking them for granted. But now they realize that as a chief, I must do A, B, C, and D. So we've, we've had instances where boreholes were provided in certain communities and the monies were misappropriated. But now citizens are demanding that, no, their monies must be used for certain things. Lands were sold. So... The, the problem we have in Ghana is that we, the citizens, are not making the demands we must make on our authorities. Now, let's be very frank. You can go to a whole district, the schools there, common KVIP is a problem. Basic things they lack. But as a society, we we'll still find a way to get money to buy these expensive vehicles that will be able to transform the lives of people in a particular district. Maybe you are looking at 200,000, 300,000 people. So, fundamentally from the citizens' front, we are not getting the best of uh, democracy. But one thing about democracy is that citizens must be seen to be demanding it. Because well, the democracy belongs to the people. That's why we always say democracy is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. That means those who are leading us, they are representing us. So why do you get people to represent you who will take actions that will not inure to your benefit? But it will rather in your to their benefit. So from the citizen front, that's why we need a lot of work from the media, from civil society organizations. You are an MPP card bearing NDC. If things are going on and they are not right, because once things are not right, all of us are going to be affected. And when you look at the problems affecting us, we may have family members living in places where access to hospital is a problem. Instances where they even have the access, you go there and no senior medical person to be able to address. I think last week I was monitoring the Joy News. They were talking about Asante Mampong, Nashanti Ridge, a whole big area, and they were saying that, oh, no senior surgeon, uh, uh, someone of a top, top level medical person when it comes to certain issues. So you live in a country, this is a country that has been independent for over 60 years now. Certain things are supposed to be very basic, but we don't have them, and it's all because of leadership. And I remember some many years ago, the World Bank made a statement that the problem in Africa is because of crisis in leadership. 
we've not gotten the leadership question right. And in a society that doesn't get the leadership question right, you are going to have challenges with your democracy. And I'm hoping that the new administration, with the aggression with which they are addressing certain issues, maybe a lot of things are going to change. I take a quick break and then we come back. And when we come back, I just uh, go to doctor and find out that in certain jurisdictions, right? So uh, an NDC MP or an MPP MP will go to parliament and there will be a bill. And he said, no, I can't vote because my constituents will be very angry if I vote. But here, constituents, so what? The party is voting. So he goes there and he votes. But when are we going to get to the stage where the people who are representing you in parliament would dare not vote a certain way because they know that the people are represent are against it. We're coming straight back. Well, 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 thank you very much for staying. And we're looking at fighting corruption and how this administration can do anything different to bring a shake-up into the system, even though it looks as if it's business as usual. We are hunting down those in the past and not necessarily those with us. And uh, before the break, Doc, I was saying that, look, in other jurisdictions, you know, an MP or a senator or something will go to uh, the parliament and they'll bring a bill and say, look, maybe we're passing a gun law or we are banning this. And you say, look, Jack, as for this one, if I vote and I go back to my constituency, I'm dead. I can't touch it. But here, you know, MP goes and it's just part... Wherever the party is voting, you know, forget about the constituents. You know, so uh, why, why wouldn't it breed corruption? So they bring a bill, say, look, we're going to set up a power plant or we're going to do free education or we're going to do this. Nobody will say, say, say that, listen, if I do this, I'm in trouble. Everybody says, yes, let's go. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know we, uh, it's unfortunate that ours is uh, bedeviled with a lot of challenges but uh, the, the the main problem we are dealing with is that it appears as if the political parties they condescend on their supporters or they patronize in other words uh, there is always the tendency for one to think that they take their supporters for granted for example when you are elected as an mp for those who have done legislative studies will tell you that usually representation can be seen from uh, three angles there is what is called the trustee. The trustee means when once you are elected as a member of parliament, you go there to be able to represent the interest of your, your country. So although this thing is, is good for your constituency, you realize that if we, I do it for my constituency folks, it will not augur well for the country. That one is there. And there's also what is called the party-dominated model of representation. Once you are elected, you represent the agenda of your party. And there is also what is called uh, the delegate. The delegate normally, we have elected you, so you go there to represent our concerns. But we know in Ghana, parliamentarians function as uh, uh, party representatives when they are in parliament. So there have been instances where certain things may not even augur well for their constituents, but they must promote it. Because we run a system where the political parties have become so influential so dominant in our politics to the extent that once you are, they are championing the cause, you are a member of the party and you decide you are not going to be part, they, they will ensure you lose the next election. And let's be very clear, voters in our part of the world, they are not that sophisticated. Once the party leadership is saying that we don't think this MP is good for this particular area, and we've, we've heard of instances where the party establishment has deliberately sponsored certain individuals to become candidates or to become the spoilers. So as long as they are there, this particular person cannot win. And when you run a system like that, it becomes a problem. Because normally, we even know in Britain where they have this parliamentary, the typical parliamentary government system, there have been instances where the MPs have noticed that, no, this thing being championed by our party, if we follow, we are going to lose the next election. And I remember in Britain, during the time of Tony Blair, uh, the tobacco vote, many Labour bank benches noticed that if they follow the leadership of Tony Blair and uh, the Labour Party in general, there are people that didn't like that, so you had a lot of them defecting uh, 
they took a decision that no, this is something Britain must have. And the only way Britain must have a, a, a ban on tobacco smoking in public places was for them to come together. And they did that, but in our system, the parties, as I said, they are so dominant, they are so controlling. Even when the party is in government, uh, don't we hear that the party chairman sits in cabinet, the party general secretary. But normally we know in many parts of the world, once a party wins election like the MPP won, no, the, the uh, cabinet aspect is that those who are party, you are workers of the party, you are also there. But we know in Ghana they need to make sure you are doing the right thing so that when they go to the people, they can say. So the parties are so dominant in our lives. Should, should we, you see, what I'm saying is that, that that's where the corruption starts from. Mm -hmm. So as you mean now, you know, they go to cabinet, president comes and says, well, now I want to distribute free mobile phones. So cabinet says, yes, they have a majority in parliament, they come. And everybody sitting there knows that, no, there's free mobile phones, we could have deferred it, we could have waited, we'd rather do hospitals with it, but then everybody. So that's where the corruption starts from. And, and, and typically, that, that, that's the reality. That's why since... We began the journey in 1993. We've never had uh, any bill introduced by the president that has not been that has not gone through successfully. At times, it will delay, mm -hmm. but we know obviously that it will go through. And we've also not had any instance where the president has vetoed a bill. Because since we began in 93, presidents have always had majority of their people. So mm -hmm. the wishes, the aspirations, the the ideas of the presidents always prevail. That's why there are many who even argue that maybe the parliament is not as significant as it's supposed to be. Because we expect parliament to be there to scrutinize, mm -hmm. to make sure that we are getting value for money. But we also know that any time there is a change of government, a decision was taken and Ghanaians did not get value for money for that decision. Mm -hmm. So in other words, once you are president and this is what you want to do, and you have the majority in parliament, mm -hmm. you, you'll be able to do it. Maybe you, who knows, in future, we'll, we may have a situation whereby the party that will win the presidency may not be the party winning parliament. Mm -hmm. And this will give us some divided government and there will be some strict checks and balances. But in practice, we've always been having a united government. The president in the, white, uh, in the uh, flagstaff house, the same uh, party will also control the parliament. And when it happens that way, you need to make sure that you have leaders who really have good intentions for the country. You have a president who has some great ideas and has the majority to push through. But if you have a president who is not so much committed to the transformation of the country, will not be able to use the majority in such a way that it will benefit the country. So, Doc, in truth, it's just a rhetoric uh, that just has to keep saying, oh, well, I'll fight corruption, I'll tackle it head on, I'll hold the bull by the horn, I'll jump, I'll jig, I'll shoot. But in truth, you know, on the ground, you know, that there, there isn't much you can do. No, I think that in spite of the problems, I made an earlier point, we are seeing some elements, some signals that things, we, we, are, we are seeing some changes. Even in the previous administration, although they had a lot of problems, we, we noticed some people engaged in certain things and or instead of them to be dismissed, they were reassigned. A whole lot of things happened and even in the uh, current administration, at least we heard what has happened at the ports, the paperless uh, uh, bailing, etc. And this uh, digital property address system, we expect that once many Ghanaians are captured, almost all of us are captured, it's going to improve upon our tax system. And we expect that with the uh, special prosecutor, which is in the offing, once we get that in place, internally we expect the president to be able to ensure that we have someone who is a special prosecutor who is so independent. Because I know in countries that use the uh, special prosecutor uh, uh, practice, what they do is that usually the attorney general of the republic will appoint this particular person. Mm -hmm. And you are not like a permanent or if you like an everlasting special prosecutor. Depending on the case at hand, let's get someone who is so independent and the person cannot be controlled by the president. The person cannot be controlled by the attorney general. The president, will, the person will be given the full powers of the attorney general in prosecuting that particular agenda. But what we are trying to do in Ghana is different. But we expect with the public record of the president as someone who has not been engaged in corruption and always talking about the need to fight corruption, to address corruption, etc., he may end up appointing someone 
who be, be accepted by the two main political divide. And once we have people like that in place, internally, if they're able to address it within their own government, I believe Ghana will be the main beneficiary. Because I think corruption is creating a lot of problems in our country, uh, from school buildings, hospitals, a whole lot of things, road construction, agriculture projects. And these are things, if we can address, I think Ghana can be a better place. I mean, uh, you know, we have Shiraj, we have the CID, police, you have the Yoko, B BNI. and if B BN, <laughs> BNI, and we are just thinking that the icing on the cake will be the special prosecutor. But that is, uh, aren't we hanging a lot on this individual when he eventually comes? If all these institutions, you know, could not handle, and some of them are so, so basic. I mean, look at Delta Force. Delta Force 1, 2, 3 are here. We have about 22 incidents of Delta Force hasn't been handled. People who drive erratic and use sirens, mm -hmm. and IGP has pronounced, don't use sirens, don't use sirens, and erratic. Uh, state buying, you know, luxury cars, a country that goes out, you know, mm -hmm. we literally live on arms. And we drive more luxury cars than the people who we, we beg from. We beg from. Uh, the paperless system I hear is making things more expensive. So, I mean, if all this institution haven't been able to stop these basic in-your-face crime, corruption, name it, what it is, and we think that the day this lady, gentleman, special prosecution comes, we are home and dry, this, we, we will be very disappointed. No, I think, I think that, that's a valid point to make. I know there are some who have argued that let's make sure uh, the Shraj and other similarly situated institutions are given the necessary resources this, so that they can prosecute this particular agenda of uh, fighting corruption for us. But when you look at the bigger picture, a number of these, they have been there and still the problem has festered. So maybe at times uh, when you find yourself in desperate situations, you want to try some desperate measures. And in countries that have used a special prosecutor, if you do it properly, you can address a number of the challenges. And then let's be very clear, although we have some of these institutions, at times too, you go there and chances are that they may have individuals who can do the work very well. At times too, the way we do the recruiting into our public agencies, at times you realize that the people are there, but the capacity to address certain mm -hmm. challenges, this, these things may not necessarily be there. So I think we should give the president the benefit of the doubt. It's a legal practitioner, someone who has understood uh, the, the way the public uh, sector works and he knows that maybe if I do A, B, C, and D, and when you look at uh, the impact of corruption on our economy, creating another institution is very, very expensive. But if this institution can help address, and I know this does not in any way suggest that the other institutions are not going to do their work. Well, we always hear of Yoko doing something, BNI, the CID of the Ghana Police Service, and even Shraj, we hear them doing a lot. Maybe for all you know, as you said, the icing on the cake, the special prosecutor comes in, the office is well set up. And internally, if even those within the current administration, those who are working as ministers, senior public uh, sector personalities will realize that there is someone who is part of the administration and has been given that latitude, that independence to be able to function and ensure that internally those of us who engage in corruption are prosecuted, I think it will send a clear signal. And I believe that although we cannot trust the president so fully to do everything right, I expect that on this issue of corruption, with the aggression with which he's been talking about it, once the office is in place, I believe if a member of his government is engaged in it, it will be very difficult for the person to be covered. Because our civil society, the media, all of us are following. And even those who like the parties, at times you realize that when things are not going well, they may come out to come and voice that out. I'm going to take a quick break, and then when I come back, we'll find out what the difference will be. If you look at all these crime-busting institutions, the BNI, Yoko, uh, IGP, the CID, Director CID, Shiraj, and now the Special Prosecutor, all somehow come from the president's office, one way or the other. Is that not the bane to say that, well, if you've given me that position, I can't arrest your children? I'm coming straight back. Well, just before the break, we were just trying to find out how it is the special prosecutor can be 
different from the above. Shiraj, Bose, Director, CID, IGP, Yoko Boss, BNI. You know, they are literally handpicked by the president or somebody's recommendation. But they're the president. And if I make you an IGP and you catch, you know, my son over speeding and you give him a ticket, well, that's it. You know, you remember the IGP, go home, I have a new IGP. And so you, you tend to find out that every... Uh, government, you know, the, 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 the police aren't able to come down hard on people who lean towards that government. And it's happening now, you know, Delta Force jumping in and out with a sense of entitlement and nobody can seem to stop them because, hey, the guy who feeds you, these are his kids. And now they're going to elect the uh, special prosecutor. <laughs> now, I, I just, you know, the, even though the president still selects the chief justice, the judiciary have been able to break away after the uh, election, you know, and they seem balanced and they were. C could there be a system where maybe the judiciary come together, select a retired judge, some 75 year old man who has nothing to lose and doesn't care who's asked? Ox is God. I, mean, I don't know. Will that bring that immunity that we're looking for? I think that, that can do something, but you know, uh, the, the problem, as you alluded to, basically has to do with the fact that we run a system, we have three branches of government. We have the executive branch, the parliament, the legislature, mm -hmm. the judiciary, and each of them is supposed to be independent. And in Ghana, I think the judiciary has really uh, been seen and has been acting performing as an independent branch of government. Mm. We can't say so much about parliament, mm. Well, we know some of the... But when you come to the executive, where most of our problems uh, lie, mm -hmm. all these agencies you mentioned, the CID, Yoko, all of them are part of the executive branch of government. Mm -hmm. And we know the executive branch of government is headed by the president of the republic. And we know in some countries they have what they call independent executive agencies, mm -hmm. which we also have in Ghana. Shiraj is an independent executive agency. Mm -hmm. When you look at NCCE, mm -hmm. Electoral Commission, these are independent executive agencies. But no, no, the reality is that we are a, a democracy in progress. Mm -hmm. We are a work in progress. Mm -hmm. We've not reached the point where, indeed, when you are independent as an executive agency, we can see you to be acting in that particular way. We have a system where the loyalties in our society our cultural tendencies have been projected into the world of our politics to the extent that there are certain things we know you are the IGP, you know this is the in-law, the daughter, the son of the president. No, you are going to be very, very careful. Or you know that as an IGP, you are appointed. Although publicly the president will say, oh, when the members of my party, they do ABC and they make sure uh, they, 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 are, they are held accountable. I think last week we had the minister for interior making it very clear somewhere in Cape Coast that, oh, in the... In the one who engages in this and that and you are a police commander, you don't act. We are going to make sure that uh, you will be called to a crowd for some questioning, etc. Politicians must make that comment. But if you are the civil servant, the bureaucracy, uh, the bureaucrat or the police officer on the ground, the street level person, you want to make sure you exercise caution. Although their, their parents are saying we should arrest them, do you think if you do, they are going to be very, very excited about it? And you know, this is a small country. It's like all of us are so connected to the extent. So it's going to be very difficult. That's why I was making an earlier point that we just need to have a leader, a morally upright leader, someone who is so transformational, someone who is so committed to the transformation of our country. And the person will be able to send a signal. And the key thing is that if you have a president who is sending the signal that this is what I want to do, and you are working under the president, you are going to be very, very careful. The reason why corruption has been thriving in our country is that when you have a leader who does some shady deals, etc., those under you, they know that's their practice, so they also do that. So if you have a president always talking about it, and I think in the last few years we've been having leaders, Professor Mills was talking about it, Mr. Mahama, and Kufuado is also doing. So let's see. If How far spill, we can go. Spill over I have, to be there. I have on the phone Adam, Adam Sedanu, who is an anti corruption campaigner. He may have the silver bullet for us. Hello, Adam, you're welcome. Thank you. Very good. Adam, uh, what can we do to reduce corruption in this part of the world? What can we do? Uh, that's a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that it's 
recognize that the uh, moral and ethical fiber of society has been crumbling. More and more, the reports that suggest that what we are seeing in the public space uh, is a reflection of what is happening in smaller units within families. Uh, it appears that the kind of standard and integrity that uh, was found within our society. Adam, if you can speak up a little bit, I, I, we can barely hear you. You can barely hear me. Yeah, if you speak up a little bit. Oh, um, I was saying that it appears that the reports that are coming in suggest that within a family unit, we have a breakdown of the kind of standards and ethics and morals that characterizing the Ghanaian society. And so it seems to me that we need to begin to talk about this right from the home. It's no longer a situation of just the public space, um, but it looks like our uh, personal morals and ethics have all been affected. And so people really, even though we talk about it and point fingers, uh, there's a bigger problem we need to address. So the first thing is to begin to look at those issues of morals and ethics again from the family system. Well, I mean, Adam, you see, uh, like, uh, rightfully said, we, you know, we just like to talk about it. And anytime we're talking about corruption, we just be line for politicians, even though, we, you know, we are all in the game. I mean, we're all in the game. I always say, you know, if a policeman stops me, uh, you know, in Takradi and says you're speeding and therefore come to court in Takradi, there isn't even a system to say, well, because you live in Tema, go to court in Tema. And 10 cities can solve the problem. Why do I drive all the way back to Tema and drive all the way back to Takradi in two days to go to a court when 10 cities could have solved the problem? So, I mean, we are all part of the game. The system itself, you know, makes it part of the game. Everything you do is cash down and you earn 500 cities. Meanwhile, you know, you have to, you know, live, maybe your bills are 800 cities. Where do you get the 300 cities from? I mean, so, I mean, we are all part of it. I mean, so, like I'm saying, we just like, you know, we, we, we love to hate it rather than actually hating it. Well, yes, I think that also the question is that what are the deterrents? Um, what are the sanctions not to get involved? Uh, and, and what are the benefits in terms of uh, to report and to, to as where align yourself with what is rightful behavior? Uh, the best that, I mean, and usually these things need to start somewhere. If we're serious enough, then the deterrents the precedence is set by prosecuting and sanctioning and making it an onerous, a uh, very risky thing to get engaged and involved in these things uh, would be very helpful. But as we we are not enforcing the existing laws. We are not setting precedent. We are not setting minimum standards of punishment that are so high that it serves as a very critical deterrent for anybody that, look, I can get away with this and therefore continue impunity. So I agree with you that the talk is a lot. Uh, are not so bad. I mean, if, if we're really serious about it, this is the kind of standard that makes behavior preventing. Uh, it's possible. I, I like to comment about how we went back five, seven years. Ghanaians were not in the habit of going to this stuff. But the minute that the, the, the price, the cost uh, for this was Well, thank you very much, Adam. Let me come to studio to uh, Dr. Bosman. Doc, you see, uh, I, I think that what you need, what we need to do, is literally educate a lot of people uh, to become moral, so that the few who don't want to be moral can be checked. But when we have all become immoral, it becomes difficult. Now, I think I, I think he, uh, he pointed out something. Something must start from the educational. Mm -hmm 
system right from the, uh, the beginning, I think there's a fundamental flaw which all of us, uh, we do admit. For example, what you were saying, you had a problem, Takrade, instead of maybe can they arrange for you to go to court at Tema and 10 cities can easily. So definitely there must be certain regulations in the society that will encourage people to do the right thing. No, the key thing is I always tell people that we the citizens must compel those who are leading us to be honest. We must compel them to be able to do the right thing. And now this again comes back to the issue that we the people are not demanding. So that's why the civil society, the media, those of us who are able to put certain agendas across. There have been instances where Joy News, you have covered the story, uh, uh, Joy FM, etc. And the, the leadership of the country has acted on it. So we should take use from that. Can we lead our people and get our people to be making certain demands? Someone is the DCE, the person is doing a good job, we commend. The person is not doing a good job, we make sure that the, the powers that be are aware that these people are not living up to expectation. Until we do that as a society, well, we've, we've lived in certain countries before, and now, amazingly you can realize that the people are not smarter than us, but they have some few people who have ideas. And they are using the ideas to transform. But in our system, we realize that the few intelligent, the few endowed, they to use be, the ideas to take away from society. And be, when it happens that way, it becomes problematic. To be continued, this is uh, just the beginning of it. This is just scratching the surface of how it is we can deal with corruption. But uh, those of you who have access to uh, Join 99.7, uh, on Wednesday, uh, they are starting a new program, which is the... Uh, Corruption Watch, and I hear they're going to name and shame Corruption Watch. Let's see how far uh, we get with that. And uh, to you and I who think it's only the politician that's corrupt, let's sit back and let us all try and be as moral as we can. Put country first and see how far we can get. My name is Alain Sakwa. Thank you very much for watching. And Dr. Bosman, thank you so much. It's been interesting. Thank you.